Well, good morning. You can probably turn that down a little bit. I'm pretty loud. <laughs> Let me read uh, Psalm 118. Um, as was mentioned earlier, my name's uh, Caleb, and I have the privilege of serving as an elder in Winnipeg alongside Jordan, who I know many of you know. Let me read the first uh, nine verses of Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. I've called our message this morning Martin Luther's favorite psalm. And when we think of Martin Luther... Perhaps what first comes to mind is the church door in Wittenberg and his larger-than-life, almost bombastic personality. We, we think of a man who was fearless in his attack on the papacy and in his defense of the gospel. We think of his braveness in his famous, here I stand, speech. Or, or perhaps you think of the learned, almost unassuming monk who, desiring to have an intellectual discussion on indulgences, started a theological fire that would consume Europe. Perhaps you are even carried away by the emotional rantings of his later life. What is true about Luther is that while he was undoubtedly an astute mind, he was a brilliant student of scripture, and he had profound intellect and an ability to really unpack some of the Pauline texts. And certainly they served as Luther's backbone in his theology and life. And we think of Galatians and, and Romans, and we think of Luther and the other reformers and their insights into these texts. What might be missed is that the German monk was a man who was profoundly in love with the Psalms. And he was a very musical man. And of course, we already sang one of his songs this morning. But he was a man who was very emotional. And he had a very difficult life. And there was periods of his life where he was very alone. And he struggled with melancholy and depression. And he would spend months on end, often using a fake name for fear of his life, translating the scriptures into the common language, very often alone with just a few friends and family nearby. He was a man, therefore, who found solace in the Psalms. And when it came to Psalm 118, he wrote a 60-page treatise on the Psalm. And in the preface to his, his uh, exposition of Psalm 118, he said this. This is Luther. This is my own beloved Psalm. Although the entire Psalter and all of Holy Scripture are dear to me as my only comfort and source of life, I fell in love with this Psalm especially. Therefore, I call it my own. When emperors and kings, the wise and the learned, and even saints could not aid me, this psalm proved a friend and helped me out of great many troubles. As a result, it is dearer to me than all the wealth, honor, and power of the Pope, the Turk, and of the emperor. I would be most unwilling to trade this psalm for all of it. You know, I think that is something we often miss. When we think of Scripture, we think it, it is there to, to challenge our mind, and certainly it is. And it is there to inform us and instruct us, and it's there to renew us, and certainly it is. But the book of Psalms is somewhat different. It contains exhortations, it contains doctrine, it contains theology, but it is there to be a friend. And I think Luther was very profound when he said that this psalm was a friend. The book of Psalms is a friend to the Christian. It takes us in any situation. It takes us in any emotional state. And it directs not just our minds, but our hearts as well to God. And anyone who loves the Lord would do well to study the Psalter. Go back to it time after time. It is a wellspring of spiritual refreshment. 
And Martin Luther was not the only one who found this psalm in particular to be a friend in times of trouble. Sometime after the Reformation, in 1745, Louis Rank, he was a Huguenot pastor, he was captured and condemned to die. And he was offered his life if he would only renounce his faith. And he was led to his death singing this psalm in French. Just weeks later, a second Protestant pastor was captured. And after evading a capture for 40 years, Jacques Roger said when he was captured, I am, whom, I am he whom you have sought for 39 years. It is time you should find me. And he also refused his freedom and sang the same verse of Psalm 118 that Louis sang just a few weeks earlier. Uh, a British journalist writing about a third Huguenot pastor who was executed, this time in 1762, said of Psalm 118, quote, It was fitting that the last words of the last Protestant martyr should be taken from that book of Psalms, which through two centuries of conflict and persecution had meant so much to the Huguenots. And it is my hope and prayer this morning and in the next few weeks that we have together as we work through this psalm that it proves to be a friend to you. That it proves to, to be a comfort, to take you wherever you are, whether times are good, whether times are poor or really poor or somewhere in between, that it proves to you to be a friend as it has for so many faithful in church history. And so let's look first at the first four verses. We'll look at the first four verses, the call to worship. The, the first four verses, you'll see, they operate as a single unit. It is a call for Israel to worship her God. And, and we don't know the exact situation that this psalm was written in. It seems reasonable to think that it was written by a Davidic king or a military general. And he is exhorting Israel to praise God for her deliverance. He is, he is returning from a battle and he's acknowledging the hand of the Lord in that. And in the nation's success. And so in the final section of this psalm, which we'll get to in a few weeks, you'll see it deals with the liturgy of the service at, of Thanksgiving at the temple. And this is the final of the Hallel Psalms. Psalm 113 to 118 are known as the Hallel Songs. And they're sung during Passover as a thanksgiving to God for deliverance. And so thus, any call to worship is a call to be thankful to God. And you will notice a few things. Notice that the call to thank God is based on his character. His goodness and his steadfast love. Christians ought always to be thankful because God is always there and he's always unchanging. And so it, it, it depends not on your circumstances but on God's character. And, and so a psalm of thanksgiving helps us to understand our circumstances by pointing us to a God who doesn't change. Or, or put it another way, think of God's goodness as a lens through which you interpret your specific circumstances. And, and that's why the psalmist here speaks of, in, in generalities about, about God before moving on to specific examples. That God is good and steadfast is consistent through the entire Psalter and all of Scripture. Psalm 73, truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Psalm 145, the Lord is good to all. His mercy is over all that he has made. Psalm 106, 107, exact same opening as we find here in Psalm 118. And so that our thankfulness and our worship is tied to God's steadfast character means it is appropriate no matter what our circumstance is. No matter what we ourselves may be experiencing, whether it is a good day, you would give thanks to the Lord. If it is a bad day, we give thanks to the Lord. If it is a trying day, a challenging day, or a day of blessings untold, we give thanks to the Lord because it doesn't matter what kind of day it is. It matters what kind of God we're giving thanks to. That's the whole point of steadfastness. It points you to a God that doesn't change no matter what everything else does. When, when theologians affirm God's goodness, we are not merely saying that God is good. Rather, we are saying that God is goodness itself. He is the perfect standard of righteousness, the perfect standard of goodness by which we would measure our own goodness, by which we would measure everything else. That is why Christ said that no one is good except God, Luke 18. 
He didn't mean that no one else can act good or that there's no other righteous action. He was simply noting that only God is good in an absolute sense. He is the absolute perfect good. And there's a second aspect of the call to worship that I want to point out for you this morning. One is it is based on who God is. But the second is that it is a call to corporate worship. Notice that the psalmist is not content simply to offer his own praise and thanksgiving to God. He calls the whole nation to the task. All of Israel, the nation, all the people. And they make special mention of the house of Aaron, which is obviously a reference to the priesthood. The priesthood. And the priests would lead the people in worship. They were responsible for the corporate worship. And so the people's responsibility was to fear the Lord. But the implication couldn't be clearer. clearer. Worship is both corporate and individual. The whole nation was called to it. And they were called to it to be led formally by the priests on behalf of others. And yet worship is also internal. It is the person offering themselves to God in thankfulness and in service. And nobody else can do that for you. The priest can't do it for you. Being a biological member of Israel did not mean that you feared the Lord. And so too with the church. Being a member of the church does not mean you fear the Lord. Being here this morning does not mean you fear the Lord. But it is your responsibility to be here and to worship corporately and individually. And there should be a formal way to lead the people in song and prayer and the hearing of God's word. But growing up in a Christian home doesn't mean you fear the Lord. But worship done corporately is by those who fear the Lord. And God's plan for his people was always that they would worship him together. Just uh, turn, turn actually to Psalm 111, just a few psalms earlier. Look at what the psalmist says. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. There's the individual. In the company of the upright. In the congregation. There's the corporate accent of it. You'll notice many of the Psalms, if you look at the top, it'll say, to the choir master. Have you ever wondered why that's there? To the choir master. It's because it was meant for corporate worship. These were songs written for the nation as they came together in the temple to worship. And the choir master would take these songs and then include them in the liturgy of the corporate worship. When we get to the New Testament, we see the same kind of thing. We see right after the birth of the church in Acts chapter 5 that they worshipped all together in Solomon's portico. Even before that, Acts 2 verse 46, that they attended the temple together. Every instruction given to the assembly of God in, in scripture presupposes and requires a regular assembly. We are to admonish one another by singing psalms, hymns, Together, Colossians 3. We are to encourage one another and to build each other up by respecting the brothers that labor among you. 1 Thessalonians. Paul writes to Timothy to read scripture, to teach scripture, and to exhort and to do it all publicly. The Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, is to be practiced when you come together as a church. Is what Paul writes. Even the very term ecclesia for the church means an assembly. Let me, let me give you a few reasons why God calls his people to worship together. Why can't Christianity be a lone wolf thing? Why would the psalmist not be content just to say, praise the Lord? Why must he call Israel? Why must we come together and call one another to worship? Let me give you a few thoughts. First, gathering corporately testifies to the world. If the Israelites only ever worshipped in their own way, in their own homes, there was no public testimony. And similarly, the church that doesn't gather, we lose our public message to the world. And we are the only ones that have the message they need. When we gather, we publicly say, God is bigger than the fears of the world. God is worth it. We publicly show the world the peace we have when we cast our anxieties on him because he cares for us. And second, gathering corporately is a corrective to a sinning brother. This is why the author of Hebrews warns us, do not neglect the meeting together, but encourage one another, especially as you see the day drawing near. Earlier in the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, we read, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away. 
And what does he say to do to prevent such a fate? Exhort one another every day. Eric Davis notes, Scripture teaches that exhortation through one another is the critical means to prevent this treachery. Given the nature of faithful Bible exposition, a high-grade dose of apostasy prevention occurs in the corporate gathering. And surely there is also an application for a brother who is simply depressed or struggling. Another reason is that gathering together takes our mind off the world and puts it on Christ. There are a thousand reasons to become distracted. There are a thousand things that happen each and every day that might tempt us to take our eyes off of Christ and put them on something else. Another crisis, another headline, another challenge. But that changes when the church comes together. When we sing, when we pray, when we proclaim, there is help in this when you look around and you see everyone else. They're here. And they're here to sing to Christ. They're here to forsake the world and reorient themselves to God. Finally, gathering together for worship is a small preview of eternity. In Revelation 4, we see the living creatures and the 24 elders gathered together around the throne of God and worshiping. After this, Revelation uh, chapter 7, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the lamb, lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. One author says that church is rehearsing that glorious day when we will know as we are known when our sin is vanquished and our Christian fellowship is fully enjoyed. As such, perhaps the most heavenly thing you can do is go to church. Attending corporate worship can whet your appetite for the fulfillment that is coming soon, unquote. So there is a call to worship. And that call is based on the character of God. And it is a call for individual worship to those who fear the Lord. And it is a call for corporate worship. Look at verses 5 through 7. And let's consider the comfort of of worship, the comfort of worship. There's the call of worship, now the comfort of worship. Now, there are two things that really jump out in this section. The first is that the author is in distress, and the second is that he is in comfort. And that presents something of a paradox for us. But of course, the difference in the heart of the psalmist is that he trusts the Lord. Notice that it is in his distress in which the psalmist calls out. The goodness of God is not a catch-all so that we avoid all pain and trouble in our lives. It is a lifeline for when we experience distress. God, in desiring to show his goodness to us in overcoming problems and finding hope through them, allows distress. And the psalmist, therefore, almost sets this up as a contradiction. It's as if he says, the Lord is good and I am in distress. The Lord is good and I am in distress in order to show us that the Lord's mercy never fails him. There, there's also a play on words here that's difficult to capture in English. The term translated distress, uh, it, it literally means to be cramped, restricted, hampered. Think of being boxed in, claustrophobic. And the term that we see free is literally the opposite of that. It means a, a breadth, an, an expanse, an open area. And he's saying, I felt restricted, I felt tied down, I felt burdened, I felt weighted by the world. But when I looked on the Lord, I felt free, like I was in an open field, a, a, an expanse, a breadth. And, and it could very well be the case that this is to be taken quite literally. He, he, like I mentioned earlier, he was uh, likely a military general or a king. And it was very possible that he was pinned down in some military situation and the Lord delivered him from that. And so regardless of that fact, it is doubtful that we will find ourselves besieged by an opposing army. We can certainly relate to the feeling of being in distress. And whether it's mental, psychological, physical, economic, the reality is, is that post-Genesis 3, all of God's people experience some level of distress. The key is how we respond to such a distress. And the psalmist responds in a godly manner and thus feels comfort. And so the first thing we might note is that for the Christian, 
it is to be expected that we would have distress. Distress is to be expected. Secondly, trust that the Lord is there. Notice that the psalmist cries out to the Lord. He does not cry out to his own ingenuity. He does not trust in his own works or his own might. He doesn't turn to any number of false gods. He calls to the Lord, the God of Israel, the true and living God. Very often, we miss the point in Scripture that God is there in your distress. And we we sometimes get the impression that, that God really just shows up with really big displays of glory. A miracle like parting the Red Sea. And he's really not around. And then he shows up, does something amazing like makes a donkey talk or, or thousands of flaming chariots with Elijah. And that is true. And God does at times choose to reveal himself in that way. But far more often, he reveals himself in very ordinary ways. In the middle of distress. That's why Amos says he is the God as one who forms the mountains and creates wind. He is involved in the ordinary things of life. Consider the story of Joseph. How God providentially brought the slave traders to buy Joseph. And how Joseph ends up in prison and then to a position of prominence. And then it was through Joseph's administrative skills that and, and, and trust in the Lord that he was able to respond wisely to the famine. And it is true that a dream is involved, but that's not the whole story. There are mundane actions taken by his brothers who travel to Egypt. And it is through Joseph revealing himself to his brothers, and their entire families were spared from the famine. And we might think, wow, that is incredibly fortunate. Imagine the good luck that Joseph was not killed in the pit. And wow, what good fortune that he just so happened to learn the Egyptian ways. And wow, what luck that the brothers stumbled back into Egypt and came across none other than Joseph. But scripture doesn't chalk any of that up to luck. What does it say? Genesis 50. God meant it for good. God was there in Joseph's distress. God was there the whole time with Joseph, working out his perfect plan. He was not present for the dream and then absent for years on end. No, God was there. And so the psalmist doesn't foolishly wait for a miracle or a dream. He calls out to the God he knows is already there. The God who loves him and whom he loves. And so not only does he trust the Lord that is there, but he calls out to him. That is to say that he puts his trust and confidence in the Lord. What does it mean to call out to the Lord like a Davidic king? It means very simply to put your trust and confidence in the promises that God has made. Very often, we don't cry out to the Lord. We find something else to cry out to. And and very often, it's because we don't know the Lord that well. And we don't have confidence in who he is because we don't really know who he is. And we don't really are able to put confidence in the promises he's made because we don't know the promises he's made. And so we call out to somebody or something else. And Israel did that, didn't they? Time and time again. They would call out to Assyria to save them or Egypt to keep them safer rather than repenting and turning to God. And so when we are in distress... We do not blindly wish for some miracle. We do not wait for some dream. We call out in confidence to the promises God has already made. Because God is there. And God is sovereignly orchestrating history for his purpose. And God loves his sheep. If you, if you, if you want to call out to the Lord, you remember these three things. God loves his sheep, God is in control, and God has a plan. That won't avoid trouble. You will not avoid distress if you know those three things, but you will have a God you can call out to 
in distress, in trials, in tribulations. And I promise you that every martyr who was marched to the stake singing hymns knew those three things. God loves his sheep, God is in control, and God has a plan. I promise you that the apostles, as they stood before men and said, do whatever you want, we will preach Christ, knew those three things. And I promise you that every Christian who has experienced the death of a loved one, a child, the distress of losing a job, the anxiety of all sorts, can find hope, trust, and confidence in the fact that God loves his own. God is in control, and he has a plan. What else could Paul have meant in Romans 8? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How could Paul say that? Was he a man who never experienced distress? Hardly. Was he aware of the future and every possible distress any of us could ever face? Not even close. But he knew that God was sovereign. He knew that God had a plan and that he was working it out. And he knew that he wasn't going to lose any of his sheep for whom he died. And so Paul and the psalmist and you and I can call out to the Lord in distress, in any distress, with full assurance of that fact. This is exactly what the psalmist experiences in verses 6 and 7. And we see two aspects of this comfort. The first is in relation to how the world looks at him. Notice he boldly declares that God is for him. And he rhetorically asks, what can man do to me? He isn't questioning whether the Lord is with him. He knows the Lord is with him. Despite his trials. And then the application is obvious. What can man do? What, what, what is man going to do? This is the point. Your fear of man is directly related to your view of God. The fear of men diminishes in proportion to the consciousness of the greatness of God. If you are afraid of man... Your problem isn't that men are too big or that your distress is too much or that the mighty men of today are too powerful. The problem is your God is too small. That's not the God of Scripture. The God of Israel is the God to whom all people will bow. It is the God who moves the hearts of men like streams of water, Proverbs 21. And people who act on a fear of man and and take the path of least resistance... They have a deficient theology proper. And the psalmist, therefore, does not fear man, nor does he fear his distress or any trials or tribulations that he has put in. And Christ himself would give us the same message. Do not fear those that can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can kill both body and soul. Second aspect of this comfort is in relation to how he looks at the world. When the world scorns the one who trusts God, we have nothing to fear because our helper is God himself. But how should we look at the world? Look at what the psalmist says. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. Triumph is guaranteed. The the psalmist does not see God's help as a moral idea or a, a theoretical ideal. He sees it as a tangible, concrete, and practical reality. The idea of a helper is is the idea of a protector, a protection. Or even even the idea of the practical help of a a friend or a family member or an ally. However, I want want you to point, uh, excuse me, I want to point out something to you, and I want you to notice it. What tense is that in? What tense is the psalmist confident in? It is future, isn't it? He does not treat God as some genie in a bottle that that will simply show up and get him out of trouble. I'm in distress. Come on, help me now. No, he says, I will. The Christian hope is not a hope in this world, but in the next. God will be with us. 
and not in an ethereal way, in a practical way, in a tangible way. And no doubt there are times in your life you can look back and you say, I see how God was working that situation. I didn't see it at the time, but I see how God has brought me through. But our triumph is future. And so hope in God does not provide an escape hatch from difficult circumstances or consequences. It provides fearless courage in the face of those circumstances. In other words, it verifies your faith, increases your reliance, and promises victory. Solomon wrote, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Psalm 112 Psalm 112, he writes this. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until, until, future, he looks in triumph on his adversaries. Finally, verses 8 and 9. The confidence of worship. The psalmist reaches his conclusion. It is better to trust God than to trust in man. Now, I'm told by the people who evidently know these things that this is the exact halfway portion of Scripture. Verses 8 and 9. So, there you go. There are 31,174 verses in the Bible, and apparently these are the ones in the exact middle. So, for the next Bible trivia, there you go. But the first thing worth noting here is that there are only two options as to where you will place your confidence. God or man. And and notice the psalmist says both man and then in the parallel line, prince. And, And what he's doing is he's saying all man, any man, whether they're mighty, noble, strong, powerful like a prince, or whether they're lowly, common, poor, and beggarly. That is to say, they're all the same. Both are the same foolish place to put your confidence. The mightiest man will fall, and yet the weakest, frailest believer in Christ will be raised again with him on the last day. The world will not protect you. Princes will not save you. Armies will not help you. The king will not care for you in your hour of need. But God not only can, he will. He will. And therefore, the reason with the psalmist is he says it's far better to trust in God and God alone rather than try to win friends with the world. Don't serve both Caesar and God. That would be tantamount to an Egyptian trying to explain to Moses that they can serve Yahweh and Pharaoh. No, God and God alone is our refuge. And the idea of God as our refuge is frequent in the Old Testament in particular. Psalm 7, Psalm 11, Psalm 57 all basically say the same thing. A a shelter, a refuge, excuse me, is a shelter from rain or storm. And, And so the psalmist is clearly using that in a poetic way to express a reliance on God for security in the midst of his helplessness. David in 2 Samuel even says that the Lord is a shield for those who take refuge in him. The idea is that God shields, God protects. God watches over. God serves as a barity, a barrier between you and calamity. That is why Christ in Hebrews 6 is said to be a refuge for the sinner. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Christ does not spare us by removing us from every earthly difficulty. But he is a safe haven and a shield so that we know we will be cared for during the storm and come out on the other side. Charles Spurgeon gives five reasons why we ought to agree with the psalmist and put our trust and confidence fully in the hands of the Lord. First, it is wiser. God can be trusted. Man cannot. Second, it is morally better. God tells us to trust him, teaching at the same time that mere human beings are corrupt, selfish, and untrustworthy. Third, it is safer. It is dangerous to trust those who are disposed to let us down, for they will certainly do it. Fourth, says Spurgeon, it is better in its effect upon ourselves. 
That's sort of what we saw with the psalmist earlier. We grow in faith and character when we trust God, not when we place that same kind of trust in other people. And fifth, it is better as far as its results are concerned. God honors our trust by blessing it broadly, unquote. I mentioned earlier that this is Luther's favorite psalm. It is no surprise then to learn that he lived by its wisdom. Luther had a friend, Duke Frederick of Saxony, and while he was alive, they would taunt Luther by saying, Luther's heresy is dependent on two eyes. When those are closed, his heresy will die. And what they meant was, is that the only power and real influence that Luther had was this protection of Frederick, and then that preserved the Reformation. And as soon as Frederick died, Luther's nonsensical theology would simply go the way of the dodo. Of course, Frederick did die, and Luther lived on. And Luther's legacy and doctrine lives on today. Moreover, you will meet Martin Luther one day. And thousands of years after his foes have been dead for ten lifetimes, Luther will be alive and at the arm of his Savior. We sang it earlier in his most famous hymn. He wrote, Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Those are the words of a man who put his confidence in God and found his comfort in him as well. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a refuge, that you are a rock. We thank you that you have brought for yourself a people and you have changed us from the inside out to be individuals who fear you. And we understand that corporate worship is a blessing and an instruction but it is not a substitute for a changed heart. And we pray, Lord, that our attitude would be that of the psalmist, that we would find our confidence and our courage and our comfort in you. And we know, Lord, that trials will come. And we do not pretend to wait for a miracle or to expect you to show up out of nowhere and pull us arbitrarily from trials. But we do expect you to strengthen us through them. And we do expect you to raise us from the dead after them, because you have promised that you would. And it is in that hope and that confidence that we place our trust and our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.